2017. And the reason we started this in 2017 is because that was the 40 year anniversary of my salvation. I got saved as a 17 year old in 1977 in the month of May. And I never owned a Bible, never touched a Bible, never read a Bible. But after being saved, the young man that led me to the Lord presented me with a Bible and challenged me to read in the Gospel of John. And that's exactly what I did. And I read not just to read, but I read to believe and receive. And in reading that way, Jesus forever changed my life as I studied the Gospel of John. What we've done... Um, since 2017 is we've taken uh, a few weeks every year about this time to go back into the Gospel of John and uh, do a verse-by-verse -verse look at it. And so far we've made it um, through chapter 11, and today we get to start in chapter 12. But uh, I hope that you can get as excited about this as, as I am, because it always speaks to me and it reminds me of the day when I first started reading the Bible, the Gospel of John, my, my first book to ever read, and it gets me excited. I hope you'll get excited about it. I'm wondering if you turn in the blue hymn book to page 383, and just sing with me the first and third verse as our prayer as we begin this series in the Gospel of John today and in the ensuing weeks. Page 383. And let this be your prayer. More about Jesus would I know. Here Jesus explains 
what is involved in the type of judgment that happened with his first coming. And then we'll look in the book of Revelation and see the type of judgment that will happen at his second coming. But John 9, 39, and Jesus said, for what? Judgment. For judgment, I am come into this world. So this is his first coming. And he says, I have come into this world for judgment. Now, when Jesus came into the world the first time, did this judgment involve punishment? No. No, not, not specifically. So we see that this is a different kind of judgment than his second coming. For judgment, I am come into this world, that, and he explains it right here, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. So put your index finger under that word judgment. Very literally, this word translated from the Greek into our English judgment, very literally, this word is sifting. So Jesus said, for sifting, I am come into the world. And basically what that means is there's going to be in his coming something that manifests. Those who are truly the children of God will believe in him. Those who are not the children of God will reject him. And so by his appearing and by all the miracles he did, by the acceptance and rejection of him, there is that sifting process. Jesus made this comment after healing a man who had been born blind. And that's a pretty hard miracle not to accept and to try and explain away. I mean, a guy who's been blind all of his life and now all of a sudden he sees, um, you know, how could you deny that? But if we look at the whole chapter of John chapter 9, we would see that there were people that did that. Upon his healing, they were not happy for him. They did not glorify Jesus for this great miracle, but rather they started making stuff up in a knee-jerk way. They tried to say things like, he really wasn't blind. So they even called in his parents as a testimony, and they asserted, yes, my child was born blind, and now he sees. So they, they made up things to discount the magnitude of this miracle rather than glorifying God and rejoicing in his healing. And so in this miracle, there was a sifting process. Who would accept the Lord on, on the basis of this and who would do to the contrary and contest the, 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 the miraculous nature of it. Uh, there were people, the religious leaders, who actually, at the time of this miracle, um, condemned Jesus and said he, he did a work on the Sabbath and you're, you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so uh, they, they uh, had contempt for him on that basis and that's the background in which Jesus made this statement in John uh, 9.39 when he said, for judgment I am come into this world. Now to get a better understanding of this we're going to put up on the screen uh, the Amplified version of the Bible just so you can see um, what I've explained is the literal nature of this word in the Greek that's translated judgment. The Amplified Bible says, I came into this world for judgment, and here's an explanation, as a what? Separator. Separator. In order that there may be separation between those who believe on me and those who what? Reject me to make the sightless see and to make those who see become blind. Those who were arrogant and did not humble themselves but thought that they knew better than what Jesus was showing and manifesting through these miracles. So, hopefully you're understanding that the judgment in Jesus' first coming was his act of separating. And being he hasn't came again, we're still in the era of the effects of his first coming, and that's what he's doing still even today, not by his physical presence, but by the testimony of his word, is he is separating. 
Showing those who are his children, children of God, and those who are the children of the devil. Those who are sheep and those who are goats. Intende. Now, as we said, the judgment is first coming is the act of separating, and of course, the judgment of the second coming is the act of punishing. If you turn to Revelation chapter 14, we see that the world is coming to this moment when Jesus comes again, and his purpose at this point will be for punishing. And of course that will be based on what has already been shown as the separation between uh, those who are his and those who are not his. So we look at Revelation 14, 6 and we see the punishing of his second coming. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Judgment. Judgment has come, punishment. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Isn't it interesting, the everlasting lasting gospel that this angel presents uh, presents God as creator. That's where it all starts. Before we can really appreciate Jesus as Redeemer, we have to appreciate God as Creator, right? That's the everlasting gospel, that there is one God and He is the Creator of the heaven and the earth. Verse number 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of what? Yeah. Wrath of God, punishment, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the second coming in, and in the presence of whom? The Lamb, which is who? Christ. The smoke of their torment is ended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Well, our text today is John chapter 12. And if you turn there uh, this morning, and the reason I gave us the backfill of this information is because we've been away from the Gospel of John for quite a while and been into it since last year and we left off with another miracle of Jesus's and that was the seventh miracle that John presented and that was the raising of Lazarus from the dead and we think of the number seven John only revealed eight of Jesus' miracles, but this one was the last one he revealed, the seventh uh, that Jesus presented that would have given people time to repent and, and to accept him before the cross. And so this is really in John's writing as he orchestrated the testimony of Jesus through the influence of the Holy Spirit, this was... Uh, Jesus' most climatic sign recorded here in John's Gospel and what it created as we're going to see now following up on what we saw in John 9.39 is we're going to see that this most climatic sign Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead created again separation. Separation. That's what we're going to see today. And that's why we, we started the message uh, where we did. And now we get into our text, John chapter 12. So when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he proclaimed this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Now Martha understood that the Christ would give resurrection. She talks about a future time when the Messiah comes that he would raise the dead. But Jesus was dealing with Lazarus' death and not the future time at the end of the world. He was dealing with Lazarus' death and he made this bold statement to get Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, to understand that he was about to do this great, again, climatic sign to show that he truly was the Messiah, the Son of God. He, he intended on raising Lazarus from the dead. So he said, present tense, I am the resurrection and the life. Now we know that Jesus had raised two other people. He raised uh, Jairus' daughter and he raised the widow of Nain's son. And so he had raised the dead before, but what made this so significant is those whom he raised previously, the widow of Nain's son and Jairus' daughter, he did it immediately. But this resurrection, Lazarus had been dead for how long? Four days. four days. Those other ones hadn't been buried. Lazarus had been dead for four days. He's already been buried. And after four days, decomposition had already taken place. It hadn't with the other two. So as a matter of fact, as, as Jesus told them to roll away the stone that covered the, the cave-like structure where Lazarus was was buried, uh, there was an objection that is going to create a very foul odor because of this decomposition. And I think we smell the effects of, of death, with, whether it be an animal or whatever, and, and we know what happens, and yet uh, Jesus uh, is going to raise him from the dead just by the commandment. He basically says, Lazarus, come forth. There are some people that say it's a good thing with the authority that he has as the Son of God that he mentioned Lazarus by name, otherwise all the dead may have come forth at that commandment, right? Something to speculate on. But again, the, the magnitude of this seventh miracle that John presents in his gospel is, is just so telling of who we worship Jesus Christ as being in reality. The one who has authority over everything, including death and the decomposition of human flesh. He can restore that by the command of his mouth. That's our Jesus, amen? amen. That's who we worship. That's who we know as our Savior. And it reminds me, it was this text that a colleague of mine preached at his own son's funeral service. His boy, Tim Watkins, was killed in Iraq by a roadside explosion. It was so that sad, it was the very day, the first time that women were allowed to vote in Iraq for their new leader, and they were guarding that process for these poor beleaguered people to finally be able to vote and it was on that day when they were able to vote that he gave his life for them to have that privilege. And so 2005, uh, Army Specialist Tim Watkins, along with four others, was killed in a roadside explosion. And because he was my dear colleague, I drove with Ron Glover. How many remember Ron? Uh, he was my chauffeur. We drove all the way out to Yucca Valley to attend that funeral. And when we got there, I think we drove the farthest. There wasn't even room in the sanctuary to sit. We stood outside and peeked into the door. And with amazement, I heard this dad, my friend and colleague, preach his own boy's funeral. And the text he chose was John 11:25, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he pointed out to us that day that Jesus did not say, I will be the resurrection. He said what? I am. I am. And that profoundly touched me and comforted me. And this is, this is the magnitude of the miracle. And yet we're going to see the result is separation 
of people and their thoughts and how they received such a miracle. Jesus does not merely say that he will bring about the resurrection or that he will be the cause of the resurrection, but he says something stronger. And I want you to look up at the screen and follow along as I read it. He says something stronger. He's not, I'm not just the cause of the re resurrection. Uh, he says resurrection from the dead in general and genuine eternal life in fellowship with God are so closely tied to him that they are embodied in him and can be found only in relationship to him. Yeah. And that's why he says, I am the resurrection. Uh, he is the embodiment of that power and that authority, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So although the raising of Lazarus was, as I've said, the capstone of Jesus' public ministry, and his public ministry is running out of time, when he raised Lazarus, it was like February 30 A.D., and when we get into the text today, we're going to be at the end of March 30 A.D., right at the time of Passover. So when Jesus raised Lazarus, it was just about six weeks prior to where we will be reading right now in John chapter 12. And again, six more days after this, Jesus died on Passover because he is our Passover, isn't he? Yes. When God sees the blood, he will pass over us. We will not be condemned. Amen. Jesus is our Passover. And he was going to die on Passover. So, uh, in John chapter 12, we're just, as you're going to see, just six days away from his crucifixion. And so obviously, this was, this miracle that happened roughly six weeks earlier was uh, the, the strongest statement yet that Jesus made concerning his deity. And unfortunately, we're going to see that there is, after such a manifestation of him and who he really is, Unfortunately, we are not going to see unanimity. But rather, as I said, we're going to see separation. Let's go back to 11, chapter 11, verse 55 to lead into our text. And you'll see what I'm talking about. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think you, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might what? Take him. After this miracle, it seems that the leadership of the Jews basically was planning on probably killing Jesus in this, uh, in this command that they gave that if you know where he is, tell us with this directive, tell us because we're going to take him. So everyone that we're looking at in the narrative in John chapter 12 today knew they knew that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. But we're going to see not everybody had the same response. This separating was still happening. So first we see the response of Mary. Uh, let's look at uh, verses 1 through 3. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he what? Raised. raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So they're having maybe a little celebration uh, supper with the one who raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus who was raised from the dead. That'd be something to celebrate, right? And so they're sitting there, Martha's serving. We know all about Martha and her serving. And all God's people said, Oh, Martha. Right? 
we know about her, her pension to serve, and uh, Lazarus, of course, uh, sitting there with Jesus. But what about Mary? In this opportunity, verse 3, it says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard. We might know it in modern times just as nard, which comes from India, they, 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 they believe. And it was what? Very costly. And she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And in that worship, in that act of worship, the whole room was filled with the aroma, the fragrance of that ointment. We see when there is true, sincere worship to Jesus, that it creates a spiritual fragrance, doesn't it? When people see you as a true worshiper of Jesus Christ and you bring worship into your regular situations of life, maybe going to a relative's house and praying over someone who's sick, or maybe at a gathering saying, time out, before we dig in, let's acknowledge the Lord for the food we're about to eat, amen? Let's read a scripture or two. Whenever we mobilize and we bring honest worship, like Richard prayed today, worshiping in spirit and in truth, we create an aroma. But Mary started it with this true uh, aroma of this costly ointment that she dedicated to Jesus. Do you know that this nard that she anointed Jesus with and she not only put it on his feet, but in Matthew chapter 26, we see that she applied it to his head. This beautiful smelling ointment that she anointed Jesus with, do you know it cost a whole year's wages? That's how expensive it was. This is what she's giving to Jesus, something that would cost a whole year's wages. Why would Mary do this? Mary was so convinced that this Jesus was so worthy to be worshipped as Lord that she gave everything she had to him. Not only did she give everything she had, but she risked being misunderstood by those who would witness this. Because after all, we're talking about the first century ancient Jewish customs and we're talking about a person who was a man or a woman who did this a woman think about first century Jewish customs and she being a woman and what she was willing to do she was so convinced that Jesus is Lord that she not only sacrificed a great amount of money to worship him but she also potentially gave up her womanly dignity as would be seen acceptable for womanly dig dignity at that time. What did she do that uh, wasn't really deemed appropriate? Well, first of all, she approached Jesus at the table. That's something women didn't normally do. In that time, the customs were that the women sat at a different table than the men. She also let down her hair in public because she actually, in this great uh, emotion of worship, used her hair to wipe the oil on Jesus' feet. And women did not let their hair down in public normally. That was something that was reserved in the privacy of the home with the intimacy of their whom? Husband. And of course, the intimacy of wiping his feet with her hair certainly, certainly would have been a social taboo in that day. But we see her response. A separation is taking place. Mary placed all that she had at the feet of Jesus, humbling herself in front of him with love and devotion. Amen? So that's the first response, and we have to ask ourselves today. We realize that Jesus is the only one 
who can rescue us from sin and death. And if we are not like Mary, if we are not willing to make him the most important person in our life, you know what that means about us? You know what that tells about us? If we can't be like Mary and join in the same mentality that Jesus is the most important person in my life, if we're not there yet, you know what that means? That means we have idols. Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. If we cannot respond to the, one, the only one who can rescue us from sin and death by giving him our most, if there's something else in our life that we're willing to give more to, we have idols. We are idol worshipers. It is not until Jesus becomes our all in all that we are free from being idolaters. How many understand what I'm saying? And that's why we gladly give our time to come to church on Sunday. When I pull into that parking lot, that's when my worship begins. My worship begins with my Chevrolet SUV. It's showing a separation. I'm like, okay, Alondra Boulevard, Norwalk Boulevard, you look, because I'm separating myself today to the Lord, what are you doing? Right? And that's what Mary was doing, showing that she was devoted to Jesus. Not only do we see Mary's response, but we see a different response in verses 4 through 6 with Judas Iscariot. Then said one, verse 4, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was what? A thief. And had the bag, the treasury that the disciples carried around with them uh, as they followed Jesus from town to town. He was the one who had that, that money bag and he wanted that to be put in the bag that he had auspice over um, because he was a thief. He had the bag and bear what was put therein. Treasurer Judas, the thief. And so, what about his response? Was it like Mary's? No. Mary's response was, I owe Jesus everything. Judas's response was, uh, I'm going to make an excuse about caring for the poor so that I could get this money. Um, Judas's response was based on self-centeredness and sin. And this was Jesus exposing him by this miracle, by Mary's response, and his lack of desire to join in Mary's worship only told who Judas really was. Nobody knew it at the time, but Jesus did. Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot was a thief. And he hadn't repented of his sins, and that's why he did not enjoy himself and enjoy this great act of worship that Mary did. This great, he didn't enjoy that beautiful fragrance of worship that was coming as a result of Mary's act. So, again, for judgment, Jesus has come into the world. He showed Mary's heart on that day. He showed Judas's heart, didn't he? How could Judas be so closely related to this miracle and not respond with anything better than what he did? Oh, what about the poor? Why are you doing this for him? This could have been used for the poor. It reveals, when he didn't even care for the poor, it reveals the darkness that was in, in him, the self-centeredness, the self-deception. Now, before we go on to the next response, let's look at verses 7 and 8. 
Jesus had something to say to Judas and his aversion. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. So again, Jesus is saying, because of who I am, I deserve your all in all. But we see another response in verse number 9. This is an interesting one, but the Holy Spirit puts it in here because we need to think about this response a little bit. This one is very applicable to the day and age in which we live. Verse number 9. This is the response of much people. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for what? Jesus' Jesus's sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the from dead. dead. No doubt Lazarus became a phenomenon since Jesus raised him. And obviously it would be that way today. But unfortunately, the Holy Spirit puts this in here because, again, there's a little separation happening based on this detail that their motivation to be there was not just because of Jesus. They wanted to go around town and say, I guess who I got to see with my own eyes, Lazarus. So there was a sort of pride about their drive to be there and, and to see this. It showed, again, what was in their heart their heart was really not to worship Jesus in spirit and truth. Their heart was to see this phenomenon of Lazarus and be able to go around and brag to people about their experience and seeing the one who was actually raised from the dead after four days. So we just say, being the Holy Spirit put it out there, what are we to get from this? These people seem motivated more by curiosity and human interest then by a motivation of really having a heart for Christ, right? We have to have discernment today. We've got to see that there is a separation between the true church and all of the other stuff we, go in, we see going on in Western Christendom that is so-called the church. <coughs> we have to discern between this. We would have to say it's, un, it's, an, uh, uh, it's unfortunate when aspects of the Christian faith are purposely sensationalized and designed to make Christianity merely a fad experience. We see this happening all the time where the church does not just stick with the word of God and stick with Jesus being the main thing. The church becomes a mile wide and an inch deep all for the purpose of trying to be the new Christian fad in Western culture. How many know what I'm talking about? And so consequently, there would be a ton of people who claim to be Christians who would come to our service today and despise it because we're not doing the new thing. They would be totally un un uninterested because all we're doing is preaching about Jesus. Oh, man. That's not too interesting, they would say. Oh, really? And so we, we have to have discernment in this area because this response is included. Not only do we have Mary's perfect response and Judas's perverted uh, response, but we have this pragmatic response. Oh my goodness, Sister uh, Sylvia, I just came up with a P outline standing here. <laughs> Ad living. That must get me preacher of the week. Miguel, I made up a whole new outline while I'm up here. All with P's. But we all have one more to go. I'm sweating. Here we go. The last response, the response and the most sad in my mind, the response of the Jewish leaders, look at verses 10 and 11. But the chief priests consulted that they might put whom? Lazarus. Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. 
my goodness, the response of the, the Jewish leaders, political concerns, religious pride, and the lust for power in these leaders gave them an astounding refusal to allow their beliefs to be changed by undeniable facts. These men had the undeniable fact, Lazarus, to see, to touch, to talk to, an undeniable fact, Jesus raised him from the dead, and incredibly, they did not allow that undeniable fact to change them one bit. Rather, what was their response? Being it is an undeniable fact, what shall we do with it? Kill it. Now, if that doesn't, if that doesn't epitomize the society that we're living in today, how many realize that there is a conglomerate corporate media that is trying to, every day, take undeniable truth and do what? Kill it. Kill it. How many know what I'm talking about? I've seen and witnessed things with my own eyes. I get around. And then I hear about it, and it's completely misconstrued and denied, and I realize that there are people like these people, driven by the lust for power, driven by political concerns and pride, that enjoy killing or censoring the undeniable facts. Amen. It is so sad as Jesus is still manifesting himself to the world, still, that it's still having a separating effect. After all these years, 2,000 years, we are far from unanimity that Jesus Christ is Lord. That should be the consensus, but it is not. We see all these different things that we see in, in John 12, 1 through 11, going on today. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And Jesus' message is still the same today. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Amen. And so in so many aspects of our society today, we see this final reaction. Because they are not willing to allow their beliefs to be changed by the truth, they have no other option than to alter or destroy the truth. Do you know the average price we have to pay for our electric bill to have church here every month is over $600? Do you know our insurance payment for our liability insurance and property insurance just went up another $1,000? We see that there is a society, something's going on, we can't even really see it, but it's there. The devil is trying to destroy the truth of churches and make it literally impossible to function in Southern California. You have to make a bajillion dollars to exist as a church in Southern California. And so it isn't, you know, some manifesto, but it is the dynamics that we see Destroy the truth. We've got a problem. Everybody's believing on Jesus because of Lazarus. What are we going to do? Him. Verse number 9. Excuse me, verse number 10. The chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. How many have ever heard of the mitochondrial E? You haven't heard of the mitochondria Eve? Don't you know Eve in the Bible? Don't you know? <laughs> the mitochondria Eve came about in about 1987. These genetic scientists got together and they discovered something incredible. Voila! They discovered through the study of genetics, the very, very complex study of the genetics, that all of humanity can link itself back to one woman. 
to one woman's DNA. And when this was announced, because everybody came from one woman, they named this discovery and the findings of this discovery with the title that this one woman from whom everybody came from because it was a study of mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA, they called this woman that they said existed 150,000 years ago, the mitochondrial Eve. And everybody had to say, well, this kind of fits the creation narrative of the Bible, doesn't it? That all of humanity came from one woman. This is not proof that we all came from Eve, but it sure is friendly to the idea that all of us came from Eve. And so everybody was amused by this mitochondrial Eve. As a matter of fact, Newsweek magazine even put it on the cover of their magazine. And everybody, all the evolutionists, they were in a hot mess. They're like, now what do we do? This supports the creation model more than the evolutionary model. Now what do we do? Well, they begin to espouse all of their theories, and uh, it was all circular to try and do away with what this suggests. And it caused one man who was in on the initial discovery to lament that it had ever been allowed to be called mitochondrial Eve. Alan Wilson, he's passed away by now, thought the use of the name, thought the use of the name Eve regrettable. And he told reporters he wishes, he wishes that rather than calling this discovery woman Eve, that she would have been called Lucky Mother. <laughs> now I say all that to say this, this has been going on for 2,000 years now. If you don't like the truth of the Bible, if you don't like the truth of Jesus Christ, just destroy it, right? My daughter lives in a place that that's what they want to do. We're threatened by people geopolitically that that's what they do. It's called communist countries, right? It's what they do. So as we wrap up today, John recorded the seventh and climatic miracle in his gospel to cause us to understand that Jesus did not work this miracle thinking that it would make everybody believe. Jesus worked this miracle understanding that what it would do is it would create a separation because for sifting he came the first time. For separation he came the first time. Now he's coming again soon the second time and that will not be for separating, that will be for punishing for the most part. Although there will be separation obviously because some will be punished and some will um, inherit the kingdom. But our final scripture, if you turn to 1 John chapter 2, I want this to be your takeaway today because we are living in a post-Christian culture and the pressure of the post-Christian culture in which you deal every day is wanting you through their pressure to have a poor self-image about your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you realize all of society today is trying to give you a poor self-image about your faith in Jesus Christ? They're trying to make you power about it. They're trying to make you retreat about it. They're trying to put you in a closet about it. They're trying to make you feel stupid because of your faith in Jesus Christ they are intent on destroying your self-image concerning your faith in the Savior. And that isn't good, is it? So here is our takeaway. And it completely comes from John again. We've seen John in the Gospel of John. We've seen John in the book of Revelation as John the Revelator. And now we see him in his epistle, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 
verses 21 and 23. John says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son, the Son has the Father also. So, do not allow the pressure of living in a post-Christian era to give you a poor self-image about your faith in Jesus Christ. The question we need to ask them when they want to make us feel ashamed is what do you have? This Christian faith that I have is centered on the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. What I have is hope for a rescue out of sin and death. What, what do you present? You see, there is nothing more beautiful and better. Ask Mary. She showed it by giving a year's worth of of wages for the anointing oil she poured upon Jesus and worshipped him on, there is nothing more beautiful and nothing better than believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Amen? Amen. Nothing's more beautiful and better than that. And we need to shout it out. We need to be proud. We need to be um, confident, just like Mary was in her example. Please stand and let us read this final verse together as the cherry on the top of our message. Let's read it out loud together. This is why John wrote the Gospel of John. And as you read it, I'm hoping you'll make a commitment right in your seat that you'll be back next week. As we're going to keep on keeping on in John chapter 12. I can't wait for next week. I'm almost, almost ready to tell you to be seated and do next week's today. That's kind of where I'm at in my head. And I want to rub off on you. So let me rub off on you by all of us saying this verse out loud together. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Amen. If you need me for anything today, please let me know. I'm a pastor. I'm here for you. We don't just have to exclude everything to Sunday. I can meet with you during the week. And whatever it is that you need to talk about, we can get solved. If you're not 100% sure that if your life were to end today, you'd go to heaven, I can show you how to be saved straight from the Bible. If you've never been baptized, we have a dear woman who's ready to be baptized. We're just waiting for one or two others. Uh, the first commandment you have once you become a Christian is to be baptized. And so see me about that. Anything else? Think of me as Jesus' under-shepherd. I'm here to try and help and shepherd you through whatever it is I can help you with. So see me today or some other time. Call me if, if I can be of help to you. I'm glad you're standing because this last presentation before our final song deserves a standing ovation. Um, George Glover has reached that age of 70-something, and uh, it's the... The more aged side of the 70 than the less aged side of the 70. And, uh, you know, he's been working at this church here and at this church at school for over 40 years. Maintaining the property, had it looking so beautiful for so long. But he got to a place where this is, Andrew says, we're like an acre of property. Two acres, wow. And it just physically got to be too much for him to keep up with everything the demands of this property. So um, we, we had to let George really, really retire. Um, but in appreciation today, we, we do have uh, appreciation for him. 
for his time of service, a little gift for him for all of his dedication and service. So as George comes, please give him a standing ovation.